It's not easy to stand for hours talking to yourself into a cheap webcam with a lot of cheap lights about enormous geographies over centuries and centuries and try to tie it all together. Sometimes you just want it to be fun stories, and that's what it's going to be this time. Let's look at Sub-Saharan Africa, let's look at Indian Ocean trade, and let's look at the way Islam helped tie all of this together. It's going to be some fun stories, some long accounts from Muslim historians. I think it's worth doing. Let's start by getting one such of these historian, intellectual, uh, legal thinker fellas. Let's get their account out right now. I left Tangier, my birthplace, on Thursday the 2nd Rajab, 725, being at the time 22 years of age with the intention of making the pilgrimage to the Holy House and the Tomb of the Prophet. I set out alone, finding no companion to cheer the way with friendly intercourse, and no party of travelers with whom to associate myself. Swayed by an overmastering impulse within me and a long-cherished desire to visit those glorious sanctuaries, I resolved to quit all my friends and tear myself away from my home. As my parents were still alive, it weighed grievously upon me to part from them, and both they and I were afflicted with sorrow. On reaching the city of Tilimsan, whose sultan at the time was Abu Tashafin, I found there two ambassadors of the Sultan of Tunis, who left the city on the same day that I arrived. One of the brethren, having advised me to accompany them, I consulted the will of God in this matter, and after a stay of three days in the city to procure all that I needed, I rode after them with all speed. I overtook them at the town of Miliana, where we stayed ten days, as both ambassadors fell sick on account of the summer heats. When we set out again, one of them grew worse and died after we stopped for three nights at a stream four miles from Miliana. I left their party there and pursued my journey with a company of merchants from Tunis. Friends, I don't know how you travel. It would take the literal word of God as heard in my own human ear to get me to join up with two people that I don't know who are also traveling and go with them anywhere. But most of my travels, I've been pretty poor, so I've been that one grumpy guy at the corner of the hostel trying not to talk to any of the other backpackers. Maybe that's just me. What matters is we've opened here with the opening of Ibn Battuta's travel log. Who is Ibn Battuta? Why only the best traveled human being on the face of the earth before the year 1500, so far as we know. This is a fella that is going to cover about 75,000 miles in his travels, if the entire travel log can be believed. He's going to go across the top of North Africa. He's going to go down the east coast of Africa, he will make it to Mali, he's going to go through the Delhi Sultanate, and he's going to end his travels in China by boat, by camel, by donkey, by foot. 75,000 miles is an enormous distance for anyone to cover, and he is going to be one of our best sources, or at least most prolific sources, on a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa, the major topic for this lecture. He, other Muslim travelers, Muslim merchants, and people who are sort of absorbing, collecting the eyewitness accounts, the gossip, the rumors, the feverish dreams of these Muslim travelers and merchants, they are going to be the people writing the written word that we have to study on what's happening in places like Mali, Ghana, a place in what will become Tanzania called Kilwa, uh, Mogadishu, and things like that. Now, a lot of what is in Ibn Battuta's account of these places is disputed, but he's still the first person to give us any eyewitness account of African society south of the Sahara Desert, so I think that it bears going through. While this is the first time that we have directly talked about Africa as Africa, it's far from the first time that Africa has been in this series of lectures. In Module 2, we started with Egypt when we were talking about it and Sumer as the earliest complex societies, births of human writing systems and things like that. 
We saw the Phoenicians move across the top of North Africa to found Carthage and then on to Spain. We saw Rome fight with Carthage, eventually destroy it and bring the top of Africa into its own empire. And most recently, we have seen the first caliphs in the early Muslim empires as they're moving up north through Damascus and including what was once the Persian Empire. We are also seeing them move west across the top of North Africa and reaching Spain themselves. So Africa's been here the whole time. But if you're thinking about that geography, you're noticing that it's only been the north. And so when we think about Africa in this lecture, we're going to cut it into two halves, but those halves are going to be a little awkward. On the one hand, there's the sort of north and east as one half, and what's going to be the defining feature there is their direct connection to overland and sea trades that put them in contact with trade on the Indian Ocean, trade on the Mediterranean, that put them in contact with what's happening to empires there, and especially in our world now, in the world of this lecture, what is happening in the Muslim world. So the spread of Arabic, the spread of Islam, and so forth. Now, very little is known about the other half. And the other half is basically all the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Before the year 1000, it's sort of a big blank spot, right? There are no Muslim traders, there's no Ibn Battutas or anything like that that make it into southern Africa, so it's very difficult for us to talk about without relying on a combination of archaeology, oral traditions, and a study of the distributions of languages, right? And that is, that, that sort of ambiguity, that sort of not knowing, that I think we can be forgiven here a little bit just on the sheer size of this place, and I hope this is a little rudimentary for you. But Africa is, of course, bigger than the United States, Europe, and China all combined. It's an enormous place with an enormous amount of people, a lot of history to cover it. As we talked about in the first module of this lecture series, it's the birthplace of humanity, the site of the first complex societies, and so on and so forth, the major site of Islam after 650. What we'll do then is just get a few very, very basic points of kind of geographic orientation to help us out with talking about such an enormous place. Africa is essentially north to south, a geographic, a climatic palindrome. You've got a thin sliver of civilization on the top, desert, dry grassland, wooded grassland, rainforest, wooded grassland, dry grassland, desert, thin sliver of civilization on the bottom. A palindrome is, is a word that is the same backwards and forwards if the analogy isn't helpful. So something like race car is a palindrome. Or, fun fact, my name, uh, if you use my nickname, is actually a palindrome as well. What is it that's cutting sub-Saharan Africa off so much from the north and from the east? It is, my god, of course, the Sahara itself, a desert that is 3,000 miles long, it's 1,000 miles north to south, and it's a difficult but not impossible barrier to cross. Now, this is a point I really want to stress in understanding what the Sahara can be and what it, what it is. You might say, well, oh my goodness, that desert is so hard to cross, there's no water. I will ask you, what water are you drinking out on the ocean if you don't bring your own? You'll say, well, then the, the Sahara is a difficult place to cross. There's no food. I will say to you, fish aside, what are you eating out on the ocean if you don't bring your own? And yes, you can survive on fish, but that's a recipe for scurvy. You're going to need some citrus, and you're going to need other forms of food and vitamins and things like that to survive long ocean travel. So you can think of the desert uh, without too many problems as a kind of hot, dry ocean. All you need to be able to cross this ocean, this hot, dry ocean, is the right kind of vessel. In the earliest days of this history, we don't have that vessel. That vessel, the single humped camel from Arabia, doesn't show up in North Africa until sometime during the first century BCE. It's not domesticated until the third and fourth centuries CE, but once you have it, 
you can cross this hot, dry ocean. Camels can, of course, go for long periods without water. They are excellent draft animals in the sense that they can carry heavy loads and what have you. So it becomes a really excellent resource for crossing this place. Once you've got your vessel, then you've got communication, then you've got trade, then your world is connected once more. But to continue giving you an idea of what a dizzying place this is, we have not only its vast geography, we also have the vast diversity of peoples that live there. A full 33% of all languages still spoken on Earth are spoken in Africa. Almost 2,000 different languages. Now, some of these, like Egyptian, Nubian, Ethiopian, Arabic, they've had written systems forever. For well over a thousand years have these languages been written down. There is, however, no written language whatsoever south of the Sahara Desert until 1800, a product of European colonialism. That is, I think, a staggering fact and not intended to be a congratulation on colonialism's part, but that is why we get the written languages at that point. Today, there's only about 500 languages in Sub-Saharan Africa with a writing system, leaving still about 1,500 that don't. Now, how should we think about this? I don't want you to go away thinking that, oh, well, everyone who speaks those languages is illiterate. Not the case. Now, another product of colonialism, if you want to get around Sub-Saharan Africa, your best bets, if you want, you know, the language with the most miles on it are going to be French or English. Folk who speak a language that does not yet have a writing system are, of course, multilingual. So they've got their language of school, the language of business, the language of work, the language of government. And then there's the language of the home, the language of your family, what you speak with your parents, what you speak with your grandparents. That latter, that's going to be the languages without a system. The larger, more widespread languages are going to be the ones with a written system, and those are going to be the ones that get used in sort of official capacities. Africa is home to many different language groups, Arabic being one that I've mentioned several times in Islamic regions. But as we move south below the Sahara Desert, we're going to run into a language family that we haven't talked about in this series of lectures yet, the Bantu language family. So most Bantu languages are actually going to be extremely similar. Bantu, by the way, in Bantu means people. So these people languages, all extremely similar, used to be thought that this was because there was just sort of one wave of migration that overtook all of Southern Africa in one sweep. That, however, no longer seems to be best practices in thinking about the movement of these people and languages. What we want to do is combine a practice called glottochronology, which is a sort of timing of when do we see languages showing up where in what areas with archaeology to figure out in what directions these languages moved first. And it's not going to be important for me for you to know exactly when a language showed up where. It's sufficient that you know that it's not one wave and basically how we know that it's not one wave. And that's from looking at archaeology related to the cultivation of plants, the development of metallurgy, and finally, then the actual spread of the language along with those other two things. So archaeological evidence tells us that between 1000 and 500 BCE, we're going to get the emergence of crop cultivation in sub-Saharan Africa. People are going to be planting sorghum, millet, and rice in drier regions, and they're going to be planting tubers like yams along the rainforest. It's going to be Sweden, or as always, I don't prefer so much, slash and burn agriculture. Sweden's a little nicer. It's not as deadly as slash and burn implies at certain population levels. So we're going to follow where we see in the archaeological record those things coming around, and we're going to be looking at the development of ironwork. The first evidence of ironwork in sub-Saharan Africa is going to come around 600 BCE, and it's going to pop up in several different locations from all available evidence independently from one another. It's going to be here in sub-Saharan Africa the most diverse furnace techniques anywhere in the world. Sub-Saharan Africans are 
to put it simply, having to do a lot more with a lot less when it comes to smelting iron, but the technology spreads throughout southern Africa by 300 CE. Now, two key properties of iron. One, iron is soft. I mean, iron is harder than a twig, but compared to other metals, it's soft. Two, iron rusts. Imagine if you are from a U.S. context, uh, the porches of the French Quarter in New Orleans, wrought iron, right? It's a soft metal. It rusts easily. It's not always the ideal thing. Steel, of course, is stronger. The difference between iron and steel is essentially the amount of carbon that's going into the process. Iron is 0.02% carbon, while steel is 1.5% carbon. And I am not walking up to a claim that sub-Saharan Africans were able with their smelting technology to develop steel. But because they had to introduce so many materials to be burned, because they had to work this iron for so long over the course of so many sort of smeltings, they do actually succeed in increasing the carbon content of iron, taking on some, but not all, of course, of the properties of steel, which I think is cool and deserves a little recognition on its own. So if we follow where the archaeological record says we see planting and we follow where the archaeological record says we see iron smelting, then we know where these Bantu languages are headed first, and sometimes it's a little further down first, and then a little back up first, sometimes really far east, and then really far west. I don't need you to know where, I just need you to know that it was not one single wave. And it's in the final centuries of these changes taking place, everyone being able to smelt iron, everyone cultivating crops on a large scale, everyone speaking a language that is from the Bantu language family, this is when we get the first records recorded in the written word of sub-Saharan peoples. In the 8th century, Arab geographers began recording notes, sometimes just wishes and rumors, but recording something, which is better than nothing, about sub-Saharan Africa. So Arabic sources, as I've already said, are going to be our main historical source on sub-Saharan Africa all the way through the 1500s. Now, most of these stories are going to be oral histories collected by indigenous intellectual classes passed down one generation to the next. And the key figure here, our royal storyteller, is going to be called a griot in French. A language of the colonizer, but that's what we've got to work with. A griot is often going to use their inherited knowledge of the past to work as an advisor to monarchs, but as you can see from the illustration on the slide, this recitation of the past is going to have musical accompaniment. There's going to be an entertainment aspect to it as well. So if we put these things together, what we're going to get is something that used to really fluster a lot of historians. I feel comfortable saying that in the 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a long period where African history was thought of sort of as lesser than because much of it came from oral traditions. I also feel comfortable saying that no real historian at a university anywhere would still think that it's lesser than based on that um, with a straight face, or they would, you know, they'd be looked down upon pretty severely by basically everybody else in their department. Because it's only been, if you saw the lecture for module 10, it's, it's, the Vikings and their Vinland sagas are oral traditions for two to four hundred years before they're written down. The Analects of Confucius are full centuries after he died, and these are somehow real sources, and African oral histories are dubious? I think not, but I'm not the only one. Nobody thinks this anymore. Nonetheless, it presents the same kind of fun and difficult challenge that we've looked at when we looked at a lot of other people. Our stories, these oral histories, are going to have things that are very obviously verifiable or not, and things that are very obviously stories about magic. Um, which are cool, but not verifiable right on the face of them, yeah? Just one more pause before we turn to some of these cool stories. Let's try to draw the roughest 
sketch we can of what African societies are going to look like before the year 1000, at least sub-Saharan African societies. People are going to be living in villages that are somewhere between the hundreds of people to thousands of people in size. That's going to be pretty small on a world scale. Fertile areas are, and this should be obvious, more populated than desert areas. In villages, people are going to claim lineages to one kind of person or perhaps a god. These lineages are going to organize people into clans. Clans are going to be, in most places, our key sort of social unit. It's not that different in many strokes from what we saw in the lecture on Southeast Asia. And some, in some ways, what we saw just last lecture on Northern Europe. Men in this world are going to be doing the prestige work. They're going to be hunting, metallurgy, military campaigns, long-distance trade, diplomacy networks. Women, on the other hand, are going to be doing the work that keeps everybody alive day to day. They're going to be tilling the soil. They're going to be gathering wild fruits and vegetables, the bulk of most of these societies' diets. They're going to be making pottery, and they're going to be preparing meals. Now, marriage patterns here are going to vary so widely that there's almost nothing I can say about it in this context. Is there monogamy? Yes. Is there polygamy? Yes. Is there everything you can imagine in between? Yes. Many men in sub-Saharan African societies, incredibly diverse though this is, most of them are going to be going through some kind of rite of passage with the men from their community that are the same age that's going to form tight bonds throughout this group and mark the transition from childhood into adulthood. And, and here this is going to sound a lot like Southeast Asia, in scare quotes, great men, men who are either very wealthy who maybe have a lot of children that they're able to use to command influence, who have a lot of military successes under their belts. These, quote, great men are going to emerge in a lot of these societies as leaders if they are successful enough, and they may be able to form some kind of chieftaincy, maybe a short-lived kingdom, but many of these alliances are going to be built on the charisma of just that one, quote, great man. And so when that great man dies, they are going to dissipate back out. They're going to give in to the forces of a kind of social entropy, much the way the societies that built up around men of prowess did in Southeast Asia. Once that man of prowess is gone, so also goes the organization that they were able to build. Proper context in hand, let's finally move to some of these kingdoms. So we're going to be based in the Niger River Basin for a while, where we're going to see at its apex of what we have to say today, the Kingdom of Mali, which is going to occupy much of sub-Saharan West Africa. We're going to see some of the world's largest gold mines here. They're going to be attracting merchants maybe as early as about the year 500. And as trans-Saharan trade grows, urbanization is going to develop in the West African Sahel, an Arabic word for sure, that kind of strip of land just outside the Sahara Desert. Not Mali, but actually the Kingdom of Ghana before it is going to be the first fully-fledged kingdom to profit off this location and this trade. Mali is going to follow in its wake by taxing the trans-Saharan trade networks as a means of developing state revenue, but both are going to be in their way pretty successful at this. Mali, a much more developed place than Ghana, more successful than Ghana as well. Our source as we turn to Ghana is going to be a man whose name is enormously long. I need you to know the last three syllables, Al-Bakri. His book of Roots and Realms, which is fantastically titled, is going to be the key source here. But all his sources are going to be second hand. Somewhat famously, Al-Bakri, our main source on the history of the Kingdom of Ghana, never leaves Cordoba, Spain. So his history is entirely rumors. We'll see where it is and is not backed up by archaeological evidence. He's going to tell us the story of many small kingdoms in this region. 
The first settlement here is going to be a place called Sigil Massa. It's going to originate in what is now modern-day Morocco, and it's going to start out as a periodic market, one that meets ever so often. And then that market is going to develop into a permanent town. Then from town, it's going to become a major trade depot. When it emerges, finally, as a city-state, and just a fun fact about Sigil Massa, its ruler needs to claim some kind of importance, needs to claim some kind of lineage, needs to have a reason why they should rule and their family should rule and no one else should. And so many times we've seen that be, well, I was related to a god, well, I am semi-divine, well, my peoples conquered this land and so we are welcome to rule, not the case in Sigil Massa. In Sigil Massa, the ruler of this city-state is fit to rule why? because his ancestors were the first to sell iron in its marketplace. As good a reason to rule as I can think of anyway. But the Kingdom of Ghana is going to come in here. It's going to be the first sort of empire-level civilization in the sort of Western Sudan region. And it's going to develop off of taxing a lot of this trade, off of which places like Sigil Massa are also benefiting. So let's turn first to see what Al-Bakri has to say about Ghana. And then let's pick some of it apart. It's a good story. The city of Ghana consists of two towns situated on a plain. One of these towns, which is inhabited by Muslims, is large and possesses 12 mosques, in one of which they assemble for Friday prayer. There are salaried imam as well as jurists and scholars. In the environs are wells with sweet water from which they drink and with which they grow vegetables. The Kingstown is six miles distant from this one and bears the name of Al Ghana. Between these two towns, there are continuous inhabitations. The houses of the inhabitants are of stone and wood. The king has a palace and a number of domed dwellings all surrounded with an enclosure like a city wall. In the king's town and not far from his court of justice is a mosque where the Muslims who arrive at his court pray. Around the king's town are domed buildings and groves and thickets where the sorcerers of these people, men in charge of the religious cult, live. In them, too, are their idols and the tombs of their kings. These woods are guarded, and none may enter them and know what is there. In them also are the king's prisons. If somebody is imprisoned there, no news of him is ever heard. The king's interpreters, the official in charge of his treasury, and the majority of his ministers are Muslims. Among the people who follow the king's religion, only he and his heir apparent, who is son of his sister, may wear sewn clothes. All other people wear robes of cotton, silk, or brocade, according to their means. All of them shave their beards, and women shave their heads. The king adorns himself like a woman, wearing necklaces around his neck and bracelets on his forearms, and he puts on a cap decorated with gold and wrapped in a turban of fine cotton. Their religion is paganism and the worship of idols. When their king dies, they construct over the place where his tomb will be an enormous dome of wood. Then they bring him on a bed covered with a few carpets and cushions and place him beside the dome. At his side they place his ornaments, his weapons, and the vessels from which he used to eat and drink, filled with various kinds of food and beverages. They place there too the men who used to serve his meals. They close the door of the dome and cover it with mats and furnishings. Then the people assemble, who heap earth upon it until it becomes like a big hillock, and dig a ditch around it until the mound can be reached at only one place. They make sacrifices to their dead and make offerings of intoxicating drinks." I find this to be an incredibly interesting account. So Al-Bakri is going to go on, he's going to say that the Kingdom of Ghana is a place that where the king can command 200,000 soldiers, 40,000 archers. That's going to seem a little high based on archaeological evidence, but trade here is still enormous. Just load after load after load of precious metals, of salt and things like that are going to be flowing through the Kingdom of Ghana. They're going to be taxing all of it, taxing it in gold. Of course, there's a higher tax for something expensive like copper, a lower tax for something cheap like salt. But it's all going to be headed eventually north across the Sahara and then on to the Arabian Peninsula, the Arabic world, and across the Mediterranean into Europe. 
What I want you to see here is where the influence of Islam is and where it is not. Al-Bakri tells us of a place that has two cities. One is going to be the capital, one is going to be this other city that's full of mosques where people perform Friday prayers. There's also going to be Muslim believers all around the king's court. And here we have to ask why. The answer, at least in part, is going to be linguistic. Recall I said that sub-Saharan African languages, none of them have a writing system before 1800. How is the king keeping records? How is the king issuing edicts? How is the king keeping their history and things like this? What is, what is the king, what is, what is his language of government? While it might be the language that the king speaks, it cannot in the written form be the language of the king. It must be that next closest, you know, massively popular language, Arabic. So, I mean, since Sumer, court accountants have been the reason we have writing. That's exactly what they're doing here in Ghana. That's why there are so many Muslim believers here. But you'll notice the king, his family, and seemingly many people around are not Muslim. So Islam has an enormous amount of influence here, but not enough to have converted the entire place. We still have our local spirit cults and things like that going on. I find it an interesting point. We step into Ghana here when Al-Bakri tells us about it at a sort of transition point. So again, Ghana is going to be welcoming to Muslims, happy to have the diplomatic connections, happy to have the trade connections, happy to have access to all of Islamic thought to this point, including the written language, but they are not all going to convert by this point. The last thing we'll say is that al-Bakri only got it in an instant, that moment when the person from whom he got this information was there. In fact, according to archaeological evidence, the capital of Ghana would shift between either of those two major cities that al-Bakri tells us about, which is another almost completely unique sort of approach to the political geography of a kingdom, an absolutely fascinating approach to applying one's power, to making sure that one's power is felt for a while in this region, for a while in another, and then one shifts back. Good stuff. Also on the order of fun stories, not in Ghana, but two miles southeast of the city of Janae in what is now Mali, we get the site Janae Juno, which just means ancient Janae, in the middle of the Niger Valley. This is a place that in the 700s is going to have a population of between 15 and 27,000 people. Not huge by world standards, but decent for the region. It's going to have smaller surrounding towns, which are going to increase its population by 500 to 1,500 people. Ancient Janae, for a bit more reference, it's going to be about 220 miles southwest of Timbuktu, again in what is now Mali. So before 1000, let's talk about this place. Before 1000, Janae Jano had a large population, but was unlike any other city that we've ever found on Earth. You look at Janae Jano, you look through the archaeological remnants, and you start looking for a couple of things. How did they live their life? What were they doing? And where was the political capital? What building here stands out as the place where there would have been a throne, as the place where there would have been a great meeting hall, as the place that would have been the seat of power? And archaeologists can find none. There is no evidence of a political center, no prominent building made of stone or anything like that. Now, because of this, Janae Jano was for a long time, not recognized as a complex society. That doesn't change until the 1980s when we start realizing, oh my God, this city, this total size is over 80 acres. We're finding mounds of debris up to 26 feet tall. They're containing waste from producing bricks. They're containing ironworking waste, copper ornaments, clay toys, all of these kinds of things that you want to see when you want to say, look, there was craft specialization, there's a high level of linguistic development, and these kinds of things. All of it's going to point to an enormous population density. And this city, like others, is going to be prospering from this trade that we've been talking about, this trans-Saharan trade network. It's going to reach its height around 1,000 when the ruler 
A little bit later, 1200, 1300 is finally going to convert to Islam. And when they convert to Islam, they're going to create, at least the inhabitants of the city will create, a pretty remarkable building. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but a question emerges. How tall do you think you can get a single building made of mud? I'll give you wooden pillars, but no other building implement. Guesses? Well, based on the Great Mosque, the world's largest mud brick building, the answer is 52 feet tall. It's made from bricks that are between 16 and 24 inches thick. It's supported by over 90 wooden pillars. Its prayer hall can hold 3,000 people. And each of its three minarets has atop it an ostrich egg. Now, you might be scratching your head to think, what does the Prophet Muhammad have to say in the Quran about ostriches and their eggs and their meaning for submission? And the answer is nothing. It's just local beliefs already held that ostrich eggs were a symbol for purity, so the people of Janae, now the people of Janae Jano, before, as they are building this temple, they incorporate that local belief system into its architecture, into its design, except now this ostrich egg is not the purity of some previously existing local spirit, but now the purity of Allah. Unfortunately, we do not know why Janae Jano, ancient Janae, collapsed. It begins to decline after the 1300s, perhaps due to the Black Death, but the answers are uncertain. Let's then turn to the history of Mali. Now, the best historical source we have for its founding is going to be one of these previously mentioned oral epics, the Epic of Sunjata, the Lion King of Mali. Now, if Sunjata reigned, he would have reigned sometime around 1230. We'll talk about where we get that date later. But his epic is an oral epic that was only written down in the 20th century, the 1900s, but it recounts the life of Sunjata, this founder of Mali, in its original Malinke language. It's the tale of the son of a local ruler, a duke, a vassal, something like that, who overthrows the Soso king Suma Oro and unites many different lands under his throne. Now, this tale, like others, is going to be handed down to us from those royal storytellers the griot. So in Mali, each king is going to have their griot, and that griot's job, as we've discussed, is going to be to know the story of all previous dynastic rulers and create a new section in the epic for the current king. It's a prominent position in societies that we've discussed. My god, you're a policy advisor, you're involved in diplomacy, you are the intelligentsia, you are the intellectual class in your world. Let's look at how Ibn Battuta describes the griot experience that he has when he goes to the kingdom of Mali. On feast days, after Duga has finished his display, the poets come in. Each of them is inside a figure resembling a thrush made of feathers and provided with a wooden head with a red beak to look like a thrush's head. They stand in front of the Sultan in this ridiculous makeup and recite their poems. I was told that their poetry is a kind of sermonizing in which they say to the Sultan, This pempy which you occupy was that whereon sat this king and that king, and such and such were this one's noble actions, and such and such the others. So do you too do good deeds whose memory will outlive you. After that, the chief of the poets mounts the steps of the pempy and lays his head on the Sultan's lap then climbs to the top of the pempi and lays his head first on the sultan's right shoulder, then on his left, speaking all the while in their tongue. And finally, he comes down again. I was told this practice is a very old custom amongst them, prior to the introduction of Islam, and that they have kept it up. If it sounds a little bit like Ibn Battuta is a bit uppity, is a bit condescending, calling their outfits ridiculous and things like that, it's because he completely is. He is happy that Mali has converted to Islam, but he has his criticisms. Any sort of remnant of the previous society, he's unhappy to deal with. It, he doesn't care for it. He doesn't care that women go around undressed at court. He doesn't care that women have a higher place in this society and things like that. He doesn't care for these kinds of rituals, but care for them or not, 
This that we've just read is the earliest account of what a griot is that we have, and it does tell us about a long-standing and seemingly elaborate ceremony. One wishes that Ibn Battuta were a little less dismissive of it so we could know just a little bit more, but what we have is provocative. A poet coming in, dressed as an enormous bird, recounting the story of all dynastic rulers, and including into that story the story of the current king. Let's get to that epic of Sunjata, our best evidence for the early days of Mali. Sunjata is going to be born to a king, again a lesser king, a duke, a vassal, something like that, to Suma Oro, and that king's hunchbacked wife. Now, I'm not attacking anybody with spinal issues. It's important to the stories we'll see in just a second. Sunjata has his own physical issues. He doesn't walk for the first seven years of his life. Now, you, myself, we might hear these things, mother has a spinal issue, child isn't walking at seven years old, and we're thinking, oh goodness, I, I, this, is, this is not going to be such a good tale, right? These, these are, this is an ill omen. Not the case. Not to the Malian audience that is hearing this. The Malian audience hearing this is thinking, oh, okay. There's evidence that there might be possession of some kind of rare spiritual powers, on the part of both the mother and the child. So what we think of as sort of disability, they're going to think of as indication of a deeper connection to the spirit realm, and we're going to be wrong, and the audience in Mali is going to be right. Why? Because one day, Sunjata's mother, fed up that he won't walk, he won't feed himself, he's not getting up to use the bathroom, anything like that, he's always being ferried around back and forth by servants, she goes to the head griot. She sends him into town, and she says, come back with a bar of iron so heavy that it takes six men to carry it. So the griot and presumably five other men go into town, and they get this iron bar, and they set it on the floor in front of Sunjata. And then finally, presented with a challenge, Sunjata stands up, deadlifts this enormous iron bar, doesn't even throw his back out, doesn't pull anything, just walks away with it gracefully. He'd never been challenged before. It was a sign of greatness, a sign of greatness that came to fruition when finally there was a reason for him to walk. Someone had given him an obstacle worth overcoming. As he grows up, what he's going to do is face off against Suma Oro. He's going to swear to defeat this evil sorcerer king. Now, what makes Suma Oro so powerful? Well, he sort of generally has an invulnerability spell around him, but he also has a certain kind of weapon. What he does is he's going around making small figurines out of people that he wishes to control, small little fetish dolls. And if he wants to harm that person or control that person in some way, he's casting a spell on those fetish dolls. And if that sounds like voodoo, it should. Where do the people who come up with the Creole religion of voodoo come from? Exactly West Africa. So this is all part of one tradition. Hopefully we can connect some dots there, right? The problem is that as long as Suma Oro has this invulnerability, there's nothing you can do about him. Until one day, in the epic, Sunjana's half-sister comes and tells him, look, this Suma Oro guy is not totally invincible. He's got a weakness. His kryptonite is the spur of a rooster, that sort of sharp guy uh, on the back of the rooster's leg, the thing that they would use in like a cockfight or something like that. So, Sunjata has one such spur procured for him. He goes to meet Suma Oro in battle. He straps the spur to an arrow. He fires the arrow. He doesn't hit Suma Oro dead on. The spur of the rooster scratches Suma Oro very lightly, penetrates his skin, but it's enough. Suma Oro is now vulnerable. He can be attacked. He's a normal human. He can be killed. His armies, along with Suma Oro, flee. Sunjata's armies give chase. They catch him. They kill him. Sunjata unites the kingdoms that Suma Oro was tormenting, and he founds his new kingdom, Mali, under the Sunjata dynasty. There's a sort of overlap here in terms of the influence of Islam with something like what al-Bakri was describing back in the Kingdom of Ghana. And it's not that Mali has two capitals and one is mostly Muslim or something like that, but the way this oral epic 
is told. So the oral epic has no mention anywhere of Allah. There's no sort of Islamic faith anywhere in there. There's no prayer. There's no, no markings of any kind like that. And yet, it does mention that Summa Oro's mysterious power is a jinn, a J-I-N-N, an Arabic ghost or spirit, telling us that there is the influence of Islam somewhere coming in here, permeating this story, at least linguistically. Al-Bakri tells us that Mali converted to Islam sometime around 1068, which is well before Sunjata is supposed to have sat on the throne. Who's to say either way? What's further interesting about this, in terms of the spread of Islam and disagreements about what makes Mali great, is that there are competing epics. By the 1500s, there are two oral accounts of Mali's greatness, and one is the one I just told you. That's about Sunjata. But Sunjata is mastering the spirit world. He's overcoming sorcerers. He's wielding magic. He is sort of supernaturally powerful and things like that. The other oral account has to do with a ruler, a sultan, a Mansa, Mansa Musa, who's a later ruler, part of Sunjata's dynasty, but who is thought to have brought Mali to greatness not through supernatural powers, but by faith in and worship of Allah and sponsoring the worship of Allah, helping realize the practice of Islam at ever larger numbers and higher levels, throughout his kingdom. So one is on the back of spirit cults, one is on the back of Allah. What can we say about any of it? Well, if we look at the historian Ibn Khaldun, perhaps the most important Muslim historian of all time, he records in his histories all of the names of the Mali kings and the major events that took place under their reign. And it is he that's going to give us that historical date of 1230 for Sunjata. So he's going to say it's real, he's going to give us some events, and he's going to give us a date. The military conquests that are in the epic of Sunjata are plausible. This is a world where big armies are existing and fighting with iron-tipped bows and other metal weapons. But to the extent that the epic of Sunjata relies on horseback warfare, that we may want to doubt. Mali started importing horses around 1000, early enough for them to have been there for the epic of Sunjata and his reign, but they were initially only used by really high up leaders who were fighting on horseback. So probably Sunjata would not have had something like a cavalry. At its largest point, a hundred years after Sunjata's reign, the Malian territory was over 1000 square miles, and by 1400, it finally had mounted armies. So, you know, the horseback stuff is coming almost 200 years after the epic is supposed to have taken place. Here, as elsewhere, the revenue for the state is going to be in taxing trade and rich, rich, rich they eventually get. Now, Mansa Musa, and it's Ibn Battuta himself who says Mansa is a word for sultan, so Sultan Musa or Mansa Musa, is one of the wealthiest kings in this region of the world during this time period. He is said to have visited Cairo on his way to Mecca in 1324 and absolutely destroyed the value of gold in doing so. This man brought 500 servants with him, reportedly each carrying a staff of gold weighing six pounds. Quick maths, that's 3,000 pounds of gold just in the hands of his servants. His walking around money took a hundred camels to pull because it was 700 pounds of gold. Part of, if you recall the lecture from Module 9, part of the pillars of Islam is the poor tax, the zakat. You have to give to the needy, and that's what our Mansa Musa, our Sultan Musa, does as he's moving along his Hajj. But he's got so much gold. He's giving away so much money that he causes throughout North Africa an inflationary crisis in the value of gold that at least one source I looked at in prep for this lecture created an economic problem that lasted for a whole decade in Egypt. So long did they have to spend getting over the fact of how much gold he gave away on his way to the Holy Land. Again, sometimes this is just fun stories. It's very cool stuff. 
Ibn Battuta is going to make it to Mali in his account 20 years after Mansa Musa's death but still going to be the best account of Mali and the best account of the Trans-Saharan caravan trade network that we have from this time period. And this trade network by this time is going to be highly, highly developed. Travelers are going to be moving around on camels, purchasing provisions in towns like Sigil Massa and places like that, creating a very tight knit, although widespread in terms of geography, community. Ibn Battuta is going to cross the desert. It takes him 25 days before he reaches a place called Tagaza, which is a major salt-producing center on the southern edge of the Sahara Desert. It's going to be a town that has so much salt that it's got buildings just made out of salt. Eight inches of rain a year they've got to deal with. That's nothing. Just build your salt bricks. Build yourself a house. It's going to be a place that is also employing a significant amount of slave labor. I mean, not Athens or Rome levels of slave labor, but they're going to be there. Ibn tells us that slaves are eating things like camel meat, dates, and millet. And he also tells us that here, salt is going to be used as a type of currency. Now, let me try just quickly to fix a, a, a suburban myth. A, a rural myth, an ancient times myth you may have heard. You may have heard once that the word salary in English comes from the fact that Roman soldiers were paid in salt. Every source I have kicking around my head says that's not true. That is not where salary, the English word, comes from. But here in Tagaza and Sub-Saharan Africa, it is true. People are being paid in salt. At the end of Ibn Battuta's time in Mali, he's going to go visit Timbuktu, a trading city on the Niger River. And there, the ruler is going to give him a young male slave, which is a very typical gift for honored guests in the region. Where is Mali getting all these slaves? Where are the slaves coming from that are mining salt? Where are the slaves coming from that are mining, as we'll see, gold? What are, what, what's happening here? Well, they're not coming from inside Mali. Instead, they're coming from the forest belt just to the south of Mali. Now, Ibn is going to take this gift of an individual, a person, and he's going to head with another caravan up to Morocco. He's going to travel with that caravan with 600 enslaved women. This here is a touchy, a touchy and, you know, unfortunate bit of this history is every Every pre-modern, most pre-modern societies will say are going to have slaves. This is nothing new in its own right, but there's a certain gendered element to the trade here. Most individuals in this trans-Saharan slave trade in the early centuries of the second millennium are actually going to be women. They're going to be sold off for the sort of unsavory purpose you're immediately imagining, concubines and things like that. But they're going to be preferred also because... Women cannot get other women at the palace where they find themselves living pregnant. And women, it was believed, are less likely to rise up in revolt. And if they rise up in revolt, it won't be as effective against an all-male army. Men, on the other hand, they can get female uh, members of the, of the court pregnant, female members of a royal or at least wealthy family pregnant. That's going to be a problem. They might represent a serious, more serious threat of revolt. That's going to be a problem. So if you want to sell them, they have to be castrated. Now, I don't know how you estimate the surgical tech of sub-Saharan Africa in the 1300s, but I'll tell you now, it was not very high. Castration can be, and often was, deadly. So, it's just a bad business decision. You don't want to go through the trouble of catching someone or buying someone someone else caught, then castrating them and having them die on you, right? So, bad economics to sell men into this slave network. It winds up being mostly women. What are the numbers? Confirmed by later historians, it's going to be something like 5,500 slaves crossing the desert each year from 1100 to 1400. That's a staggering, staggering amount of people. It's not Atlantic slave trade numbers, but this class stops at 1500, so we don't deal with the Atlantic slave trade. It's not just people, of course. Mali is also exporting an enormous amount of gold. 
and in the 1200s and 1300s, a full 66% of all gold that was entering Europe was coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa through Tunis, through Fez, and through Cairo. Working conditions mining this gold? Abysmal, and that's the other reason why Mali needs enslaved people. We're going to be sending enslaved men down into sometimes 60 foot deep mine shafts, which are going to collapse frequently. It's hot. It's deadly work. And they're going to be pulling gold ore out of the ground. They're going to be passing it off to enslaved women at the mouth of the mine who are going to be extracting the ore and preparing it to go on some of those very same caravans that are carrying other enslaved women off to be sold in North Africa. By the time Ibn Battuta makes it to Mali, it is a fully Muslim kingdom, if perhaps not as early as al-Bakri had said it was. Now, Ibn, is gonna, Ibn Battuta is going to be pretty judgy about how some, they behave in some respects. What we have to remember, if we want to understand his judgment, is that there is no Pope of Islam. Um, it's wrong to draw too many parallels, but if if... This is, I'm assuming, for U.S.-based audience, and so Protestantism reigns here. And there are many different denominations of Protestantism, and even within one denomination, you don't know how church is going to go one way in this region of the country versus in another region of the country. Islam is a little similar. I mean, there's no one in a big hat saying all of it is exactly this way. Here's how we, here's the standard way to pray. Here's the standard way to practice. Here's our official view on this. Here's our official view on that. So you get a wide diversity. Even today, you get a wide diversity depending on where you are. Rulers in Mali are going to please Ibn Battuta because they are mostly male. They're going to displease Ibn Battuta because descent is tracked through the mother's line. So one's sister's son, for example, is going to sit on the throne, not the son of a male king. He's in general going to be a little uncomfortable that women are more powerful uh, than they are back home in North Africa, even if they're still not able to be kings. He's going to leave Mali pleased with its secure roads and high attendance at Friday prayers in mosques, but he's going to judge the fact that uh, women working as servants around the court are going to be mostly nude. This bothers him quite a lot. And even when they are not in that capacity, the general higher place of women in other places in this society bothers him not a small amount. This is another source of bias and judgment that comes out if you read his text. Mali itself is going to continue as a major kingdom for almost a century after Ibn Battuta's visit. In 1433, they're going to lose control of Timbuktu, however, that major trading city where uh, Ibn Battuta was given a slave, an enslaved man, as a uh, gift. And by 1450, the neighboring kingdom of Songhai is going to defeat the Malian army and end the Sunjata dynasty. So if our dating is correct, that's 200 years of the Sunjata dynasty. Not too bad, but it does come to an end. Let's try to get to a few other places in the world. What is going on in North Africa where all these golden people are being sold? Well, by Ibn Battuta's days, it's been divided into three sultanates. And each of these sultanates is going to be sending thousands of pilgrims every year on the Hajj, on the pilgrimage. They're going to be going through Cairo. They're going to meet up with each other there, other pilgrims and things like that. And they're going to form huge caravans which travel on to Mecca. By 1261, Cairo was going to be the cultural capital of the Islamic world under the Mamluk Empire. And it's going to establish this empire, establish power after the Mongols are going to take Baghdad. They invade Cairo, but do not hold it. They take Baghdad in 1258, eventually resulting in the Il Khanate, a dynasty that gave us those images of Muhammad that we used in Module 9. Mamluk territory is going to be quite big. It's going to include Egypt, it's going to include Syria, and it's going to include Arabia. This is a place that has changed a lot since we looked at it under the Umayyad Caliphate. When Ibn Battuta is in Tunis, it has a population of about 100,000 people. There are Europeans there trading textiles, weapons, and wine for animal hides, cloth, 
gold, and of course also slaves. But almost all of North African states are going to be sultanates by this point, and they are going to all be operating large judicial organizations staffed by that figure that was created in Module 9, the Qadi, Q-A-D-I. So whereas we saw sort of in the early expansion of the Arab kingdoms, maybe less organization than you might be accustomed to seeing in the operation of an empire. By the time we get to the sultanates, everything is very standardized, very organized. There's a lot of legal thought that's been produced. There's a lot of bureaucracy, all of the things you want to see if you want to see someone building a stable and long-lasting pre-modern state. Who is staffing these organizations? Well, anyone who studied Islamic law at an Islamic school was eligible to work as a Qadi. The courts are going to be implementing Sharia law, rules for all Muslim people. And it's going to, you know, you're going to get different legal philosophies based on where you studied, different interpretations of what Sharia law is and how it should be applied. Ibn Battuta himself is only one of many schools. He's part of the Maliki school. So he's going to meet other people on his travels with whom he's going to disagree who are members of the same faith. And in this world, a Cadiz decision is going to be called a fatwa and it's going to have the force of law. Now, you might be asking, thousands of people flooding across North Africa, through Cairo, and then on eventually to Mecca. I have traveled, Nick. I have seen what travelers are like. It's gross. International travel can be uh, an unwashed and beer soggened, soggened, laden, a beer, beery, a drunk time. Now, the drunk time you don't have to worry about so much because we're talking about Muslim faithful on the Hajj. But nonetheless, people get out of hand when they are not in the land where they're from. Who's keeping them in order? Well, Ibn Battuta's life gives us a uh, kind of an answer to that question. When Ibn Battuta leaves Tunis, he's leaving Tunis as a Qadi for a caravan of Berber pilgrims on their way eventually to Mecca. So this at least implies who's keeping order over all of these pilgrims going on? Well, they all have a chaperone, basically. They all have a Qadi who's extending the will, the power, the law of the Sultan back home over them as they travel. The word Mamluk originally meant a non-Muslim slave who was used by Islamic states as a warrior. We're getting probably as close as I can think of to a real-life kind of unsullied, if that means anything to you. Rulers in Afghanistan, North Africa, Spain, and Egypt throughout the 8 and 900s, they're all purchasing huge numbers of slaves from Turkic civilizations and areas from Central Asia, and these slaves are going to be staffing their armies. These Mamluks are purchased as children. They're going to be forced to study Islam. Conversion is going to be mandatory, and they're going to come into this world as, of course, my goodness, outsiders. They're going to speak Turkic languages, although they will eventually take on Arabic because they are studying while they are there as children. They're banned from performing any manual labor, just focus on military training. What's the buy-in? Why would anybody stay? How is this not a recipe for revolt? Well, eventually it is, but it's a stable system for centuries. Why? A couple of things. One, your children are not born into slavery. So unlike other systems, here, a Mamluk can start a family, and that child will, free is the wrong word in this context, but will be a sort of normal subject of the Sultan, not an enslaved person. So you want to stick around and be good for the sake of your children. Two, you can rise within the ranks of the military. Awesome. So you can be promoted, so you can have a better job. So even if you are still enslaved, you know, you're invested in the system. Three, and most important, once your conversion to Islam was finished, you were freed. So there's not just a way to buy in, you get out, at least of the slavery aspect of the system. You did not choose to go there, you did not choose initially to convert to Islam, but there's enough sort of pros for you that it's worth buying into this system. That is why, for the most part, we don't have just like constant high-level revolt of this slave army. But we do eventually have revolt. 
Mamluk soldiers are going to stage a coup against the reigning powers in Egypt in 1250 after the impacts of Mongol invasion. Then they're going to found their own dynasty. In 1260, they're going to experience a really rare thing, a military victory against the Mongols. We're going to have 12,000 Mamluk troops face off against 10,000 Mongol archers at the Battle of Ain Jalut, just north of Jerusalem. And because of their Central Asian background, they've got a certain familiarity with the Mongols, how the Mongols operate. They're going to be able to out-fight them, out-strategize them, and win one of the very few armies to defeat the Mongols in direct combat. Once they rule, they claim to be the protectors of the Islamic world. And this is going to make sense to a lot of people, given the Mongols coming through. Now, the Mongols are not particularly against religion, but they are causing an enormous amount of political tumult that people are fleeing, a lot of war that people are fleeing. In 1261, three years after its initial destruction by the Mongols, the Mamluk announced the reestablishment of the Caliphate in Cairo. Thousands of refugees are then going to start pouring in, and they're going to be, including teachers and things like that, staffing colleges called madrasas. Between 12 and 1300, we get a new type in this world of intellectual mixing, a new type of Islamic mystic called a Sufi. And followers of these Sufis are going to believe that the Sufi had divine grace, Baraka, and could give others direct access to a law. I don't mean something like pray on their behalf. I mean direct, direct access to a law. Sufis are going to form lodges where they're going to teach their disciples. And in death, it was believed that a Sufi's baraka, their divine grace, would hang around at the place where they died. So their death points are becoming pilgrimage sites for Sufi believers as they're sort of also traveling along the normal pilgrimage to Mecca. Networks of Sufis are going to get absolutely huge. It's going to span from Egypt, where they're headquartered, all the way out to China. During this period also, the population of Cairo is going to skyrocket, up to something like four or five hundred thousand. It's a city that's only going to be outranked by a few Chinese cities in turn for the, for the top of the position of largest city in the world. The top of this society is going to be a bunch of different classes, and most of them will be obvious. Mamluk the rulers, military commanders, record-keeping and tax-collecting officials, Islamic uh, nobles, wealthy people who are not part of the actual governing, called the ulama. They're going to be independent from the military, but powerful in their own right. We're going to get merchants, traders, and brokers, also the kind of toward the upper end of society, wealthy members of the Mamluk ruling class. Below the elites, we're going to have traders, shopkeepers, and craftsmen, then on to farmers. And finally, at the bottom of this society, we're going to have the occupations that violated Islamic law, but that Islamic society saw necessary so you keep these people around. Usurers. You don't know what that is. Usury is the second oldest profession. Loaning someone money at an interest rate. Forbid by the Quran. Necessary to keep society running. So, usurers exist, but they're at the bottom. Slave dealers. For all the time we've been talking about slave dealing, it is against Islamic law, and so people dealing in slaves, despite what they're adding to the economy, they're the bottom of society as well. This is going to go for alcohol sellers, sex workers, and anyone who has to touch a dead body in the normal doing of their business. This is the bottom rung of the Mamluk Empire. Now, among other things, the sultans of Mamluk are getting a lot of cachet out of being this cultural capital, and they are making a name for themselves, enabling people to go on the Hajj. So they're providing camels, food and water for poorer people who want to make this pilgrimage, and many travelers are going through Cairo up first to Damascus, and then only after that south down to Mecca. In the 1300s, this flow of people, however, began to bring with it the Black Death, the bubonic and then later pneumonic, as you know if you saw the prior lecture, plague. The first outbreak here is going to occur in Eastern Europe in 1346 in the Black Sea port of Kaffa, and from here it's going to go to Italy, it's going to go to Egypt. Modern historians estimate that the plague this time around killed between 33 and 40 percent 
of the population of Egypt and Syria combined. And it would take another two or three hundred years for population levels to return back to what they were before the plague happened. If we're happy to leave Egypt collapsed by plague, we can keep moving on into the Indian Ocean and down the east coast of Africa. Here the Indian Ocean is going to be the trade link between East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and West India. And we're going to get this sort of ocean-linked area where sultans in these regions are building government coffers by taxing trade and forming governments that look broadly similar. Some sultanates were very small, places like Kilwa Island in Tanzania. Others were very large, so we'll talk for just a second about the Delhi Sultanate in a bit, which is going to control as much territory as the Mauryan or Gupta dynasties ever did. The point is, though, this is going to be a broad area connected by ocean, not land, with a lot of cultural mixing. People partaking in these trade routes are going to be doing it on small boats called dows. It's a sail powered, but there's no deck. You're sort of sleeping in the boat next to your cargo. Many, many small ships is what makes this trade possible. And the first place on our stop is going to be Mogadishu in what is now Somalia. Along these routes, it's going to be exporting cotton textiles from Egypt and things like that. And Mogadishu's political structure was like other African ports. It's going to be headed by a sultan. Justice is going to be administered through Cadiz. In Mogadishu, rulers are still going to speak some Arabic, but we're going to see that language fade as we move south. Further south, then, we get that island, Kilwa, where people are already beginning to speak Swahili, a sort of Creole or mixed language based mostly in Bantu but with a considerable amount of Arabic borrowing. The Kilwa dynasty began sometime in the 1200s with kings descended from Arabic-speaking settlers who came to the area from Yemen. Its Indian Ocean ties include its main exports of slaves and ivory, and its dynasty is also going to control, I think this is a very interesting political geography, a small port called Sofala on the Zambezi River 800 miles south, and nothing in between. we got our port on our river, we've got Kilwa, we've got 800 miles of no control in between them, because that's all it needs, the sort of like fledgling city-state out there, to get access and maintain access to goods like gold, ivory, resins, and as always, enslaved people, which are traveling from these really remote inland places out to the coast and then being traded off into the Indian Ocean network. Kilwa also had a stone palace modeled on Islamic palaces from across the Indian Ocean. Townspeople are going to be living in stone houses that reflect in an intense way the trade to which they are linked. They have indoor toilets, they're using Chinese porcelain in their kitchen, and they're wearing imported silks from across this oceanic trade, along with gold and silver ornaments from across exactly that same trade. Excavations in Kenya show that mosques in the region date back to about the 700s, so we're getting an influence coming from the north, from the Arabic world, we're getting influences coming from as far east as China. It's an incredibly cosmopolitan place, East Africa, during this period. Let's turn once more and let's turn inward into southern Africa. We're going to know much less about this region than even what I just said, those scant facts about Kilwa, but we know it's a place that's supplying Kilwa with gold, ivory, and of course, as always, enslaved people. On the high plateau, south of the Zambezi River, we're going to get a state that we think reached its greatest extent sometime in the early 1300s, and that state is the Great Zimbabwe. In the Great Zimbabwe, we know that people were cultivating sorghum, with iron tools. We know that before 1000, they lived in small villages and wooden houses, and we know that after 1000, they became wealthy enough for stone enclosures. Over the 12 and 1300s, the population reached something like 10,000. Not huge by world standards, but large for southern Africa. We're going to have about 300 small stone enclosures in the area of this large 
plateau. Now, the word for these enclosures in the Shona language means venerated houses, and you might guess that word is Zimbabwe. If we look at the elliptical building of Great Zimbabwe, the largest stone structure in sub-Saharan Africa before 1500, we're going to see a place that was probably built by about 400 laborers over the course of four years during the agricultural off-season. Now, there are no written records, only archaeological evidence about local religion. We know there's no evidence of any practice of Islam whatsoever, just local spirit cults and that kind of thing. And we know that the top of this archaeological site has six highly stylized birds carved out of soapstone. Now, these birds might be gods. They might be homages to ancestors. We don't know. The folk of the great Zambezi also made and probably worshipped phalluses and female torsos, so bodies with no head, arms, or legs, in relation to fertility practices. But again, this is archaeology's best guess on scant available evidence. Kilwa and the great Zimbabwe were most prosperous at exactly the same time for exactly the same reason, sell almost exactly the same things on exactly the same ocean trade network. By the time the Portuguese discover it, however, it had dramatically, dramatically declined for reasons unknown. Portuguese show up in 1498, and what they see is a big stone wall and a very small and not prosperous at all civilization living there. So our friend Ibn Battuta, he's been to Kilwa as well. He's left Kilwa and he's headed for Central Asia. When he's in Central Asia, he learns that there's a Muslim leader named Muhammad bin Tughluq, who is hiring foreign-born Muslims to work in his government at Delhi. Why is there a Muslim person in charge of a government in Delhi? Well, in 1210, the Mamluks overthrew the Sultan in Afghanistan and came to rule much of North India. Five dynasties exist between 1210 and 1524, and I want to stress that these dynasties do not see themselves as directly connected to each other, but historians, because they're all sultanates, and because they're all in the same place with their capital at Delhi, refer to them as, collectively, the Delhi Sultanate. The Delhi Sultanate is going to, of course, be the capital of a few later northern dynasties. Of course, it is definitely the capital of India today, so it's a significant place. Southern India is going to remain out of the control of this place under the rule of the Cholas, who we talked about a long time ago, or other southern kingdoms. The Delhi Sultanate is going to be a politically tumultuous place. Here, there's a sort of general belief that the sultan who rules best should be able to prove themselves, should be qualified in some way, and that's going to mean low-level civil war. The first Mamluk to seize power killed the reigning king and named himself sultan in 1210. After every sultan's death, we get then, in search of this most qualified person, a huge power struggle until a new sultan emerges Tons and tons and tons of internal conflict, disruptive to local societies, traditions, buildings, etc. Muhammad bin Tughluq is the son of a Turkish slave and an Indian woman, and his armies have plundered across northern India until he can gain political control through this tumultuous system. And his move, the reason that Ibn, he comes on Ibn Battuta's radar, is because he has decided that he's going to eliminate any competition among the aristocracy, among the learned classes, by refusing to hire any of them to work in his government. The goal is to make the, an aristocracy a new aristocracy that is loyal to him in case of another rebellion among Indian Muslim ruling classes. Ibn Battuta moves there. He becomes the highest-ranked Qadi in Delhi, but does not, awkwardly, speak the language of government, which you're thinking is going to be a Sanskritic language here. Not the case, because you've forgotten where they came from. The language of government in the Delhi Sultanate is Persian. Weird also for the Delhi Sultanate. I mean, it makes logical sense in terms of politics, if not in terms of religious beliefs. 
You may recall that when we talked about tax systems of the first Islamic empires, we had a second class of people called the pro given protected status, the peoples of the book, and that was, in the first expansions of Islamic power, Jewish and Christian people. Now, as later Islamic dynasties come to control Persia, they inherit a large Zoroastrian population, and you can't just make those people third-class citizens. You can't have everybody in the most egregious legal and economic position possible. So we saw there Islamic rulers incorporating Zoroastrianism into this second class, into the protected status, Zoroastrians becoming peoples of the book. What do you think we get when we have Islamic rulers ruling over a massive Hindu population. Delhi rulers granted Hindus the status of Dhimmi, protected subjects, basically alongside uh, Jewish people, Christians, Zoroastrians, and so forth. We're having a certain bending. Does that make sense within Islamic religious thought? No. Does that make political sense? Of course. Yes, it does. Hindus begin paying a non-Muslim per head tax like any non-Muslim elsewhere, but they're not the bottom rung of society. The Sultan here is even sometimes repairing Hindu temples that were damaged in the conflicts between the leaders, or would-be leaders, of the Delhi Sultanate. And Muhammad bin Tughluq is actually infamous for his support of Hinduism, not Islam. An awkward position from a religious perspective, a completely sensible position from a political perspective. South India, however, remains out of control of these folk remains strongly Hindu among the people and the rulers alike. Rulers who are going to be patronizing Sanskrit and Hindu temples while building powerful enough armies to build a dynasty that lasts for 200 years. And you better believe that their sponsorship of Hinduism gives the Delhi Sultanate in the north a run for its money in sponsorship of Hinduism, forcing them to sponsor a religion in which they, formally speaking, don't believe. Now, Ibn Battuta is going to stay in India until he's sent to China as an emissary for the Sultan in Delhi. He's going to travel with 15 other envoys, 200 slaves, 100 horses, and lavish gifts of textiles, dishes, and weapons for the new power on the throne in China, the Yuan Dynasty. Who are the Yuan Dynasty? The Mongols. But we'll talk about that when we talk about the Mongols. And that's it. What have we achieved? Well, hopefully we have learned something about the geography of the spread of Islam in the early second millennium. All across North Africa into near Saharan, sub-Saharan Africa, places like Mali and Ghana, down the east coast of Africa and into northern India, but not into southern Africa, not to places like the Great Zimbabwe. And the further we move from the Arabian peninsula, the more that influence fades. And even where its influence is strong in places like Mali, there's a certain lack of orthodoxy going on there. Hopefully that is interesting to you. Hopefully that gives you a vision into this society. Hopefully you also noticed that in many places, as it's adopted and adopted unevenly, it's the lower rungs. It's those who are not in power who are the least willing. It's those in rural places who sort of cling to their old beliefs. Maybe the center does for a while, as we saw in Ghana. Or maybe the center fully converts because a different power has come in, and it's, and it's the sort of grassroots of that society that cling to what existed before, as we saw in northern India. Either way, I hope it's been a good time. This is one of those fun story lectures, so... I hope the stories were fun. See you in the next one. <laughs>